Part of my job is to go into places like Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia. I regularly go into active conflict states and combat zones. Recently, I was near the Somali border where we were working with refugees that had been fleeing from Al-Shabaab militants. It was there that I met a little boy. He was from a poor village that was attacked. And he was found clinging to his mother's corpse. He couldn't speak. He was too weak to stand, too shocked. He survived and he's alive. But we all know that that's not truly living. This child had nothing but his mother's love. And now he lost that too. So I wondered, what will his worldview be as he grows up? Will he one day be given an opportunity to fulfill his potential, contribute back to his community, maybe help rebuild his country? Or will he grow up angry, desperate, with a lack of choices? You know, he may be given a choice one day, but that choice might be to have to pick up a weapon just to be able to feed his family. But what if we could help him fight back? What if we could empower him to be able to fight on his own front lines against poverty and extremism? Wouldn't you agree that it's a far better investment to build up our allies and our friendships today than it is to have to fight and pay for more wars later? One of the greatest threats to our national security is the spread of violent extremism. Groups like Al-Shabaab, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, ISIS. They are very clear that their goal is to destroy America. They understand that Whatever happens over there is not isolated any longer. What happens over there affect us here at home. My work in these conflict states has shown me, I've seen it firsthand, these impoverished, ungoverned spaces are being targeted by these extremist groups because they need these places to be able to grow in strength, in number, and in influence. So through the years, I've seen the power dynamics, the security dynamics of our world shifting. And I believe it's important now, more than ever, to understand the role of development in the context of national security. And why is development so important? One-sixth of the world's population live desperate lives, devoid of hope, devoid of opportunity. They're going to look to whatever leader steps into that void and offers seeming hope or seeming opportunity. So the fact is, these ungoverned spaces and fragile states in the Middle East, in Central Asia, throughout Africa, will be exploited by extremist groups. It's not a question of if. It's a matter of when. These areas of instability, they inevitably become breeding grounds and exporters of terrorists, criminal networks, refugees, so many other problems. And because we live in an interconnected world, their ability to spread their violent ideology beyond the geographical borders is growing exponentially. We've seen it recently with more homegrown terrorists. Right now, groups like Al-Shabaab, they're winning the hearts and minds of individuals like that Somali boy. When I was last in Iraq, I saw that ISIS is providing humanitarian aid. They called themselves the ISIS Department for Relief. That's when I realized these violent groups, they're not just the enemy. These extremist groups are our biggest competitor, except they seek out chaos where there may be no rule of law. They inject their idea of governance. 
they provide security, they use food, medicine, they build schools to win hearts and minds, they leverage technology and social media to propagate their twisted ideology. They're relying on the fragility of these communities to further their agenda. These are the new threats to our national security. And as the threats to our country have evolved, we must be prepared to change the way that we tackle these new threats. In the past, the way that we have fought violent extremism, it's been fragmented. It's been reactive. The military working in one silo, humanitarian agencies in another, and it hasn't worked. We have the strongest, most powerful military in the world. Brave men and women with the most sophisticated capabilities. But military leaders are the first to acknowledge that we cannot combat the spread of violent extremism with military power alone. Because any of these kinetic military gains, they can't be sustained without coordinated development. As for humanitarian action, continuing the approach of applying reactive Band-Aid solutions, it's counterproductive to countering violent extremism because by the time we can integrate these development programs into a community, it's too late. It's too late because we're still responding, sometimes with unsustainable solutions that I've seen sometimes leave communities even more fragile than before we intervened. The answer is that we must become proactive in our approach. Proactive development must be seen as a critical component to our national security strategy. I serve as a CEO for an NGO called Linking the World. We've stepped up to the challenge. We apply the latest data analytics and predictive modeling tools to be able to identify communities around the world that are impoverished, but also at most risk of being influenced by these extremist groups. We're able to isolate and identify the root causes of instability in these areas and then help shape programming to mitigate those conditions of vulnerability before the extremist groups can go in and exploit them. Our nation's holistic winning strategy must include, yes, our powerful military. It must include effective diplomacy and foreign policy. And it must include just as powerful of coordinated, proactive development so that we can give individuals like that Somali boy a chance to fight on his own front lines against that vicious cycle of poverty and the exploitation of extremist groups. This is our way to take the fight to the enemy before they bring the fight here. Right now, our enemies are winning the hearts and minds in this fight. We cannot allow that to continue. We must win. America must lead. Because if we pull back now from this global leadership gap, we will not like who fills the void. Thank you.